Before even walking up, I'm like, dang. Nothing I hold on to. And I just, I just be thinking about all the things I'm wrestling with holding on to, you know? And I'm like, ah, whoo, you know? You, it makes you want to get in a very more somber, melancholy, reflective space before you come up and have to preach. <laughs> um, for those who don't know me, my name is Corey Spencer. I've been a part of MRSA about a year, going on two years, year, a couple months uh, from the Bronx. Um, um, Paris didn't like, well, yes, he did. He did, uh, what do you recruit me? He did. He did. I, I can't, I, I want, I don't, I don't want to lie. He was telling me to come before I came and I was telling him, no, I'm my, my purpose right now is in the Bronx. And like two years later, and then God made it clear, like we need to move. So, and now I'm here. So, and I'm, and I'm grateful for you all. Last week was amazing. I know people keep saying it, but last week's uh, uh, service was amazing. It was amazing. Um, if you like me, I just love seeing people happy. I love seeing people smiling. And then I start smiling, and then the back of my head starts hurting. Does that, does that happen to anybody? If you're smiling too much, the back of your head starts hurting? So I was so encouraged, the back of my head was hurting. I was like... I need to. I need to sleep. I've been. I'm full. I'm full. I, I need. I need to. I need to take a nap right now. But it was just so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The encouragement went round and round. <laughs> I promise that's the only one. That's the only one. Uh, but it, it really was a great time, an amazing time to to be with you all and encourage one another and see each other encouraged. Um, but we're back. In Acts, the forever book, uh, the book that uh, has given us so, so, so much. And um, so we're in Acts 14. But before we jump into Acts 14, I want us to spend a little bit of time recapping. Um, what did, uh, it's been two weeks, so it may have faded in your memory, but uh, we talked about Acts 13, Parish Priest on Acts 13. Can anybody fill me or remind us of what we uh, talked about in Acts 13? I'll give you some clues. This is the, the Antioch Church. Okay, oh, hold on one second. Can we get some, Hector, can we get some mics? Or a mic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is for hello, hello. Zoom, Zoom. Zoom. Uh, is it uh, Paul and Barnabas partnership? Mm, yeah, we did talk about Paul and Barnabas. Hello. This is a uh, partnership. We talked about the leadership in Antioch. What, it, what was the point he made about the leadership in Antioch? Right, right, right. Right. Oh, it's on. Oh. I, you know, I would prefer you just scream out, but because we have people on Zoom, I want to make sure, you know, so, so if you raise your hand, what did we talk about in terms of the leadership in Antioch? <laughs> Sorry. The, the leadership in Antioch was mixed Gentile and Jew, mm. and um, yeah, and I also remember something about the... Uh, the uh, Drove out the spirit in that uh, girl, right? And there was a, um, you know, how he he really commanded. It wasn't it that or a guy? Maybe a guy. He he he, uh, he drove out a spirit. In. He called him the devil. He called him the devil. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jesus. Okay. All right. All right. All right. I, I think the second part of the scripture we looked at was specifically about how Paul was speaking with the Jews mm. and the message he shared was yeah. like summarizing the gospel and one full like paragraph. Yeah. And then how some of the Jews followed um, uh, Paul's teaching and asked him more questions about it. But then when the whole city came out to hear the message, it was their envy that actually like mm. drove them yeah. from being able to receive and um, fully accept the message, uh, which was really interesting because it wasn't that they were rejecting what he s was saying was untrue, but that the crowds that he was uh, able to attract um, and the kind of power shift that was taking place with the word and the gospel that he was sharing yeah. was actually intimidating for, or maybe it was intimidating for the Jews that were listening. So it was the Gentiles at that point who actually benefited from Paul's sharing. 
Yeah, we did talk about uh, his message, how uh, it was a full gospel, right? Full gospel. Um, we talked about uh, how it resembled whose message? Stephen's message, right? And the connections there. Uh, and we, we had a really good conversation about this Bar Jesus guy. Um, so uh, anybody want to uh, tell us about what did we talk about in terms of this Bar Jesus man? I remember it was really something to think about the fact that Paul, while challenging this man, understood him because he had been in the same place and gone through the same experience. And that it may have seemed harsh, but sometimes um, that's what it takes to get to turn, you know, to turn our hearts around and help us to see the truth. Mm, yeah. We talked about uh, where he lived and how that may have influenced his way of thinking. Anybody want to, anybody remember that? Tim, you got something for me? Yeah, that, it, it made me, it was very, well, anyway, uh, because he was Jewish and he lived in that area, the fact that he was a sorcerer was kind of a big deal. Mm. And just how that might have come about by his uh, compromising uh, with the people around him, and it yeah. just kind of developed to the point where he was a, a sorcerer, and you yeah. know, it, it it made me think about a lot of, a lot of stuff in my own life. Yeah, yeah. Anyone else want to add? Okay, so um, we're gonna jump into Acts fourteen, and um, I know we're gonna have our. Christmas service next week. And that normally means once you get like, once Thanksgiving comes around, it's like New Year's. At least, that, you know, I, I don't know. That's how my mind thinks. That's how my mind thinks. It's like, oh, it's Thanksgiving. That means New Year's is right around the corner, right? And then that comes with, huh, what am I going to do next year? Where am I going to be next year? What are some things I want to accomplish? You know, I, I don't often make New Year's resolutions anymore because I kept failing to keep them. <laughs> so I don't make New Year's resolutions anymore. I just make, I just have goals, life goals that I'm going to keep working on through some years. Some things I want to accomplish this year. Some things that may take two years. But I was thinking, you know, as we prepare for next year, there's something that I think we're going to need to really grow in. And the Spirit put this message on my heart, and even till this morning, I was still adding stuff. I woke up, I'm like, it's finished. And then I'm brushing my teeth, and I'm like, it's not finished. It's not finished. <laughs> I have more. I have to put more down. Um, but we're going to talk about faith. We're going to talk about faith today. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, what should be fruits of our faith as we see it in Acts 14. Fruits of our faith, as we see it in Acts 14. Can I get someone to read uh, 1 through 7, Acts 14, 1 through 7? Go for it. Oh, man. Okay. <laughs> it's happening. At, Icon at Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went, as usual, into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles and, po and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. There was a plot afoot among the Gentiles and Jews, together with their leaders, to mistreat them and stone them. But they found out about it and fled to the fled to a Ly Lyconian cities of Lystra and Derby, to the surrounding country, where they continued to preach the good news. Awesome. So, just a little background. They're in Galilee. No, sorry, not Galilee. Um, it's it's the it's the G. Uh, Gal Galatia, sorry. They're in Galatia. Uh, and in Galatia, there's two districts. There's Lyconia and then there's Pergia. Pergia, I think I'm saying it right. And then within Lyconia and Pergia, there's other like ministries. So it's, it's kind of like being part of Central and you got the shore of Mercer and then Mercer, you got uh, what we have as our mission groups, right? Like all these little pockets of places. So there was uh, in... Um, 
Pergia, they have this legend that there was a, a king who ruled there, and he got an oracle saying that there was going to be a worldwide flood. Sound familiar? Yeah. Right? And he was like, okay, there's going to be a flood. So he went and started uh, uh, petitioning his gods. And you, yeah, I'm pretty sure you know what, ha what didn't happen. The flood, the, his petitioning didn't, didn't work. Uh, so the flood came. It washed them all away. And then we get some Greek gods, Prometheus and Athena, who make images out of mud. Wind is blown into them to create life. And the earth is repopulated. Does that, sound, does that story sound familiar? Huh. So this is what's going on in this place. This is their history, right? This is, this is part of what's kind of got them going. And to me, it makes sense that there's a synagogue there, right? That Paul and Barnabas go, and there's a synagogue there. Because maybe people finally, some of the people were like, maybe the way we was doing it was wrong. Maybe that's why we got washed away. <laughs> or, or the people before us got washed away, right? Maybe we were serving the wrong God. So this is the kind of place that they're entering, right? This kind of place that has this kind of history. They preach. They preach the message. People rejoice. Then some people disagree, and there's some conflict. And what is Paul and Barnabas' response? They stay longer. I thought this was really interesting. They stayed longer. They saw the issues kind of bubbling up, conflict brewing. I mean, I think they've been around. I mean, Saul... He's been around. He's, he's officiated with the, what's about to happen. He knows how this goes down. You get out of Dodge right now. It's just about to go down. You know. But they stay longer. They stay longer. The people that they just shared the gospel with, who just received the gospel, were worth fighting for. Paul and Barnabas' faith compelled them to stay and kind of theologically fight it out with these people. Right? These guys came, tried to poison the minds. They was like, oh, yo, let's get it in. We got to stay here a little longer. Is holy conflict a fruit of your faith? Is holy conflict a fruit of your faith? Because make no mistake, fighting for people's souls is an act of faith. We don't know what people are going to do after they get saved, what kind of things are going to happen. But we move with the confidence and reassurance that like, we're doing the good work that God has called us to do. So who is your faith fighting for today? Who is your faith fighting for today? Fighting sometimes means you need to be bold, right? It said they, they was there, they persuaded them or spoke in such a way. Maybe it was, it was very charismatic. But then there was a distinction when the conflict came. The conflict came and they said they spoke boldly. They spoke boldly. And sometimes, yeah, it's good to traffic in the laid back, calm. Let me just tell you what it is, bro, sis. Share, share this good word with you. And then sometimes you need to just boldly, plainly speak the truth. See, I think the goal is to fill people up with so much faith that they won't concede to the lies or to the poisoning of minds, so to speak. Right? To fill people up with so much faith that they won't concede to the lies or the poisoning of minds. We need to be fighting for people. But the question is, where's your faith? Where's your faith? You know, this is a spiritual war we're in. This is a spiritual war that we are in. Sometimes you need to stay a little longer and push a little harder for people to get the message. 
And what happened then still happens today. It just kind of happens like online, on blogs, text messages. There's still people in between decisions, right? There's still people who are getting anti-gospel messages. Ah, you don't need to be with people. You don't need to trust. You don't need to love. Chase the money. You know what? You know what you should hold up? Your rights. You're American. <laughs> There's all of these other messages. And sometimes... We got to stay a little longer and push a little harder for it to cut through the noise. Not everyone's going to get the message when you, yeah, bro, Jesus is Lord. You should come to church. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Sometimes, sometimes there's some people, depending on where they're at, they need more. And we have to have the faith to give them more. I can only think about my life, that there's some things I'm just learning after being a disciple 20 years. But it's because God stays long beside me and keeps pushing me. And I have friends who stay long beside me and keep pushing me. There's messages I've heard when I was one year in the faith and it took year 10 for me to be like, oh! That's what he was talking about. I remember the first time there was a brother who studied the Bible with me. And he got asked to lead a campus ministry in Buffalo. And he came back and he gave me a pamphlet. and was like, you need to read this. Really intense. And I'm like, now I got baptized at 18. I, and I can't say that I was that spiritual to comprehend a lot of things. But he gave me this pamphlet. He's like, you need to read this. And I'm like, okay. I mean, this is a brother who studied the Bible with me. I respect him. I'm reading. It was on spiritual warfare. Bunch of scriptures and stuff. I'm like, what, are you, what happened to you in Buffalo, bro? That you coming back with pamphlets and giving them to me, talking about, read this. I, 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 didn't, I didn't comprehend. I didn't get it. And he told me about his experiences and things, supernatural things that he believed happened to him up there, which prompted him to create this pamphlet. I didn't, I threw, I kind of threw, I didn't throw it away, but I put it somewhere that I couldn't find it until later when somebody else came and preached. And I was like, oh, that's what he was talking about. We're in a spiritual war. And I think we got to ask ourselves, has our faith produced holy conflict? Are we running from things? Are we running from tough conversations, from tough people, from tough environments? That's a reflection of our faith. Paul and Barnabas knew these people's souls were worth fighting for to the point where it was like, they only left after they was about to get stoned. It was like, oh, they picking up the stones. <laughs> right? They stayed until that very, that moment. I would, man, I would have been gone way before. I'm sorry, forgive me. I would have been gone way before. Once I would have saw the grumblings, I would have like, oh, I know what's about to go down, yo. Barnabas, pack it up. Let's go. <laughs> but th this is the situation that they was in. But they chose to stay. They chose to stay. Whose life are you staying in? Mm. Whose life are you staying in? I'm sure some of the people who they preached the word to initially rejoice are some of the same people who chased them out of town. But is, is, is it about the results? Yeah. Right. No, I don't think it was about the results. They were doing what God called them to do in faith. We need to have the fruit of holy conflict coming into the next year. Because I believe God is blessing us here in Mercer. But with more responsibility become more challenges. Satan is going to start working even more. 
And we have to be ready to be able to grab each other and say, let's, let's go to war. Let's fight. You are worth it. You're worth it. These people that we don't know that we're going to share the gospel with, they're worth it. And maybe I might come and share the first time and it's not really working, but maybe I need to stay a little longer and make my presence known, make the Lord's presence known. Because this is a spiritual battle. You think Satan is just backing down like that? You share your calm little word. Yo, come to church. It's great. Satan's like, oh! Man, that was, that, was, that was too much for me and my soldiers. That was too much. We got to back down now. Let them go. That's not how this works. That is not how this works. The Bible does say stand firm and he will retreat. Stand firm and he will retreat. That's what they did. They stood firm. They stood firm. And then got chased out of town. So they leave uh, Iconium to go to uh, Lystra, right? No, uh, Laconia. They leave Iconium to go to Lyconium. I think that's how I'm, I'm, is, I'm saying it right. And a lot of interesting things happen. Can I get someone to read 14, 8 through 20? 14, 8 through 20. Go for it. So in Lystra there sat a man crippled in his feet who was lame from birth and had never, ever walked. He list. Am I reading the right part? Yeah. Okay. 8 through 20, you said? 8 through 20. 8 through 20, right. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed, and called out, stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lysonian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas, they called Zeus, and Paul, they called Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd, shouting, Men, why are you doing this? We too are only men, human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from those worth, these worthless things to the living God who made heaven and earth and sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all nations go their own way. Yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. Awesome. So uh, at this moment, we're going to have a little bit of interaction. If you could turn to your neighbors and uh, talk about what the Spirit is revealing to you in this passage. And then we'll come back together and share out. That was a, that was a good enough amount of time. Can I get everyone's attention, please? Everyone's attention, please. <laughs> Sorry. Check, 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 if check. we could, if we could turn our seats around. Um. So we have, uh, we have the microphone. Please, uh, wait till the microphone gets to you, so our brothers and sisters on Zoom will be able to hear. Uh, but what are some things that the Holy Spirit revealed to you from this passage? Anyone? Our group, well, our group talked about how 
uh, you know, just the boldness, you know, that, that it takes and the confidence, I guess, when you feel like the spirit is backing you up to get into those conversations and that it's not about us, you know, mm -hmm. that, you know, the spirit is moving us to get into these challenging places. Yeah. And how a lot of times we, you know, we lack confidence, but the spirit is going to give us what we need and back us up because um, I, I think Rachel was sharing how the focus, you know, um, you know, that sometimes we get distracted when things get, you know, muddy and then just, you know, really uh, just really going for it and allowing the spirit to take us where we need to go. Because that's and, and I was thinking, like, as this starts to grow, um, there's going to be more needs. They're going to come up and we're, we're the ones that, you know, need to jump in, you know, and um, and stick in a little longer. Because I know with us, we were thinking about I was thinking about how when things got hairy with us, like there were people that just stuck in there with us. And a lot of times they didn't have answers. They just they just rode with us, you know, and, and that was instrumental in us remaining faithful. So, Amen. so. thank you. Oh, wasn't actually ready, but it's, cool. yeah. it's all good. Uh, yeah, I was uh, sharing with the group that uh, in verse three, actually, there is a second part to uh, Paul and Barnabas actually speaking boldly. Uh, and that was that uh, uh, God confirmed the message of his grace mm -hmm. by enabling them to perform signs and wonders. So it was like, OK, as a reward for the fact that you're just stepping out, being bold and just speaking up. I'm going to shore up any insecurities that you have, any uh, 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 places where you're not as strong, you know, be, uh, through me. You mm -hmm. know, so all I need you to do is just kind of like I was just kind of like, you know, uh, uh, show up and show out. And then at the same time, I'll take care of the rest. Amen. You know, you're not going there to persuade anybody. You're not making a sales call. You're not making a sales pitch, a persuasive speech, anything like that. All you need to do is just speak about boldly about what you believe in. And I'll take care of the rest. Hmm. Yeah. Amen. Uh oh. Pass the pee. My group did a lot of like sleuth work. Yep. Oh gosh. No, they they did some they they did some stuff, man. They, oh, that ain't what I call shot. I'm a little. I'm sharing on behalf of the people, all right? <laughs> and so one thing that we were talking about is just like the, the, Greek, the Greek mythology behind it all. Mm -hmm. And, you know, how in Greek mythology, there's a story of, you know, two gods that came down in human form, came to a village, say, held somebody, the village didn't respect it, and then they ended up, um, you know, trying to chase the, these, these people out, then these people ended up being Zeus and Hermes, and they destroyed the city. And so that being in the backdrop of the time, these, you know, they worship these guys thinking that they're gods, you know, like, oh, this God's in human form. Mm -hmm. And we were just interested in the fact of what made the crowd switch so fast. Like, why did they just, they were just praising them and now they want to kill them. And we were like, it probably was the fact of, you know, Paul admitting, hey, we're not gods, we're humans. And then these guys, which I didn't even get it, the system was sharing how they came from, you know, uh, Antioch, Antioch and Iconium. All the way down to Antioch and followed them here. It was like, yeah, not only are they not gods, they're humans, but they're evil. You know, and it's like, oh, so they could do powers and they're evil? Like, mm -hmm. we need to get rid of them like that. Fear and confusion like, is like a scary place with dealing with people um, because it could cause people to do some of the more terrifying and terrible things. And so we just thought that was an interesting thing on how they turn so fast yeah. on them. Yeah, you know, interesting fact, Lyconium, Lyconium is traditionally interpreted as wolf land because there was a legend that like there was a guy who transformed into a wolf there. Right. So so you have Hermes, you have temples for Zeus and Hermes, and then you got people worshiping or thinking that people transform into wolves. They was in straight heathen land. They was they was in straight Gentile territory. They this once they left Iconium, there was no synagogue. They they, you know, street preachers, so to speak, on the byways and highways. But any other comments? 
What's some other things that stood out to y'all? Good morning. So our group had some thoughts that were similar, but one of the questions that and it came up with was, how would we in today's world fight for each other? How would we do what they did? Mm. What would that look like? And so we were thinking through, but then we wanted to make the question broader. What, how would you fight for somebody? Who is it you're fighting for now? Mm -hmm. That is a good question that I have some notes on. <laughs> so I'm not going to answer right now. Um, I don't know what my group was talking about before I came back from the bathroom. <laughs> but we eventually settled on... Um, not just what happened uh, in this particular passage, but how by this time they were used to persecution. Mm. Um, and what we were recognizing is we've not been persecuted. And like, so what's wrong with that? <laughs> um, mm. If Jesus told us to expect persecution, if we're following him, if we're not, you know, what does that mean for us? Mm. 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 Okay. Hey, hey, amen. See, that's what happens when you let the spirit speak. Um, we spoke about a couple of things. One, one of the things was what sort of power did they have to be speaking with to be mistaken to be God's? Mm. Uh, mm. Another thing uh, we spoke about was the, um, the ability to speak faith into another person such that this man went from being disabled to being healed. Mm. Another thing we spoke about <laughs> was that this man's faith could be seen. Yeah. <laughs> right? Um, You're doing too much. You, all right? I, all right? Like, come on, man. Nah, it's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. I can't, can't quench the Spirit. If you got more, keep going. You, you, you gave the mic. <laughs> you asked. You asked. Um, I just want to say um, one thing. So um, a couple years ago, I got out of the, um, the military. When I got out, I was going through like a lot. And I came to the church. When I came to the church, I started thinking that everybody here was against me. Mm. So um, I kind of like backed out of the church. So I started isolating myself for years. And I was going through like PTSD. And um, two days ago, right, I was laying down. And um, I had been taking like natural medicines. And two days ago, I had like, well, for years I had all these voices in my head and talking to me. Everything stopped two days ago. Wow. And um, it was like a miracle because um, these voices were telling me so many negative things and bad things. And um, I couldn't like talk. I couldn't read books. I was like, um, it made everything hard to learn. And I, like, I used to like try to speak so loud because I was trying to talk over these voices. And now they disappeared. Mm, <laughs> praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I'll, I'll let one more go. <laughs> Amen. I will continue. Um, so one of the things I thought was interesting, I'm going to flag some things I thought was interesting, and then I'm going to focus on the thing that, I, that really spoke to me. So one thing I thought was interesting was the message that Paul preached to them. Did he, did he say Jesus? Was, did he mention Jesus in his message to these people? No. No. He was, he was being blasphemous, right? What's going on here? How could you preach a message to people, convict them, then be saved, and you don't even say Jesus? Right? Because we talked about last week the message that he preached 
was the full gospel. So what is this? Is is this the full gospel? Is this less the full gospel? You know, um, a scholar says that the brilliance of Paul is that he met the people where they were at. He helped them to see God in the things that were extremely important to them. Right? So that's why he's like, he gave you food. He gave you the rain. Right? These are things that they can identify with. If he would have came with Jesus, they'd be like, huh? We got Zeus and Hermes. He was like, yeah, yeah, but God, let me, let me help you. Let me help you understand. I thought that that was really interesting. I thought that was a, a huge point. Um, I think somebody took my points about the, 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 the pagan sacrifices um, and uh, the Greek mythology behind it. That, I think that was really interesting. Um, and, you know, I, one of the things I thought of was like, huh, if Paul and Barnabas weren't like on point, they could have almost mistaken that these people um, like worshipped like them. Right? Because they, they brought an animal. Like, we know we bring the animal. We slay the animal. This is how you worship. They could have been like, oh, y'all, you know, y'all just so close. <laughs> you know, just so close. You know, I, I thought about how many times I may have fallen into that trap of seeing people s- just similar. And then I'm like, I'm, maybe because I'm, I'm, fe- I'm afraid of the conflict. I'm ready to just double, yes, you good. I mean, you just, it's a bull and there's a reef on it and it's the other people, but it's close. It's close enough, right? Uh, I know that I've, I've been susceptible in my fear of being, you know, of having that holy conflict. I'm like, I'd rather not have the conflict. I'd rather just, you know, everybody, kumbaya. Um... But the part that really, really resonated with me. So we were on vacation uh, on a cruise like three weeks, four weeks ago. And I'm reading this, just trying to repent from not like following along. And this verse stood out to me, which uh, my brother Damon was starting to get in my notes. Uh, Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed. Paul looked at him and saw that he had faith to be healed. I couldn't help but to think about when uh, Jesus says, go, let it be done for you according to your faith, to the centurion. And his servant was healed. I couldn't help but to think about when Jesus said, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well to the bleeding lady. I couldn't help when he said, according to your faith, let it be done when he healed the blind man. Couldn't help but to think about when he said, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed. And then when you think about those scriptures, you can't, I mean, the Holy Spirit was just like, yeah, but, and he did not do many deeds of power there because of their unbelief. Paul looked directly at this man and saw that he had faith to be healed. And I thought, how much of our own wholeness is contingent on our personal faith? How much of our own wholeness is contingent on our personal faith? Over and over, Jesus says, your faith made you well. Your faith healed somebody else. The scriptures don't even tell us the size of the faith of the people who are being healed. It's almost saying, almost, I can't speak for the scriptures, but it's like, you, you don't need to know. What you do need to know is this person had enough faith for that person. For that person. Is our faith making us well? 
Is your faith making you well? Is your faith making your marriage and your relationships well? Is, is your faith helping those who are in your life? You know, the spirit convicted me because it made me think perhaps, perhaps there are people who aren't saved and people who aren't well because of my lack of faith. Because of my lack of faith. Perhaps issues stay longer in my marriage because of my lack of faith. Perhaps there are things I'm still struggling with because of my lack of faith. Where's your faith today? Where's your faith today? Do you even have aspirations for the size of faith that you can have? See, my fear is that we stop reaching for deeper and bigger faith. That we aren't intentional about growing our faith. So I want to just spend a little bit more time on this faith to be healed. And I want us to read a scripture in Matthew 17, 14 through 21. We're going to talk about having a mustard seed of faith for next year and what that can do. Is that all right? Is that all right? Okay, I want to make sure y'all still with me. Matthew 17, 14 through 21. The Spirit led me here, and hopefully what convicted me will convict you. Um, Starts, it says, when they reached the crowd, a man approached and knelt before him. Lord, he said, have mercy on my son, because he has seizures and suffers severely. He often falls into fire and often into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't heal him. Jesus replied, you unbelieving and rebellious generation, how long will I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring him here to me. Then Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him. And from that moment, the boy was healed. The disciples approached him, Jesus, Jesus privately and said, why couldn't we drive it out? He says, because of your little faith. He told them, for I assure you, if you have the size, if you have the faith, the size of a mustard seed, you will tell this mountain, move from here and there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. So you have this man, Paul's preaching. You have this man. He has faith, right? He's listening to Paul's message. He has faith or Paul sees that he has faith and he heals him. Right In this scripture, there's this guy who has faith in Jesus and by extension, faith in Jesus' disciples. Brings his son to the disciples. Hey, heal my kid. I, I have faith. Y'all could do this. The son, didn't, the son didn't get healed. The son didn't get healed. So then he goes and he brings the son to Jesus. What's, what's Jesus' response? Is he happy? Could we say he's a little upset? Is that safe? Could we say maybe he's a little frustrated? Who's he frustrated at? He's, a, he's frustrated with the disciples. That's interesting. Why? Why is he frustrated with the disciples? Because they were supposed to take care of that. They were supposed to take care of that. Think about that for a second. Jesus gave them the power to go take care of the people. Somebody with faith in Jesus, maybe we could call him a brother. Maybe. He's he's on the borderline. He comes. My son is sick. Brothers, disciples, heal him. They can't do it. And Jesus is frustrated because he's like, y'all supposed to be able to do this. 
why is this guy coming to me? Why is this guy coming to me? Now, I know, I know, this, this, this may seem sacrilegious, what I'm saying right now. We're all supposed to come to Jesus. But Jesus is making it very clear. You were supposed to take care of that. And it's because of the size of your faith that you couldn't. Do you think that's changed? That Jesus expects us to take care of each other. Is it possible, this is a stretch, this might be a stretch, that Jesus is looking down at us like he did his disciples, like, why are these people coming to me when they should be coming to you? I gave you the power. I gave you the power. Why are there hungry brothers and sisters in your ministry? Why are there people looking for homes? I gave you the power. Why are they coming to me? You know, James 5, 16 through 18 says, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. How much is our faith healing people? How much is our faith making us well? Imagine if all we had was a mustard seed. Jesus is Jesus telling them about moving the mountain isn't about actually moving the mountain. It's about doing what they was actually supposed to do, which was heal the kid. He's like, if you just had a mustard seed, you would have been able to take care of this. Do we have a mustard seed of faith? Do you have a mustard seed of faith? Because there's going to be a lot of people that need healing. We got a lot of issues that need healing. It will not be healed unless we have the faith. It's not going to be healed with a nice conversation. Yeah, had a good conversation with this sister, with this brother. We read through some scriptures. We got to up our faith. We got to up our faith. You know, the layman believed in Jesus in the message that he believed in Paul and, knew, and had faith that Paul could heal him. I don't think it's any different with us. If you have faith in Jesus, your faith should translate to your brothers and sisters. That you believe that they can help you. That you believe that when they pray for you, you could be healed. Or maybe, maybe, maybe we should not be coming to each other. That's an alternative. Maybe we come together, we sing, we have a good old time, and then we go to God with the stuff that we need. Go to Jesus. I think Jesus is challenging us here that like, our one another relationships should be healing each other. Our one another relationships should be healing each other. I have to think, if there are people who have been in my life for a long time, and of course, I'm not going extreme, trying to say that like people don't 
make decisions and God doesn't have other plans. I think we know those things. But I do think this is an area to evaluate. Are there people suffering around you? And they've been suffering around you for a long time. Is that perhaps a reflection of your lack of faith? Is that a reflection of your lack of faith? I want to read this last thing. I see kids coming down, so I think I'm I ain't going too far. Um, okay. <laughs> and I had a lot more. Um, and the scriptures led me to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. And I'll conclude with this. It says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. This is what the ancients were commended for. Now, faith is confidence of what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. I couldn't help but thinking how many decisions um, I make based off of things people did or didn't do in the past. And I couldn't help but ask myself, is that confidence and hope and assurance in the unseen? Or is that making decisions on what I've seen? And how many of us do that? We don't do this or we don't do that because we had this experience in the past. We know what this looks like. So we just kind of project that into the future. I thought it was crazy that like sometimes I base my decisions on what's seen and then I turn around and call it faith. And then I wonder why I'm not growing or I'm discouraged. It wasn't faith. And I think some of us, myself sometimes, can have a twisted kind of faith where we are confident and have hope. But it's in like harmful, negative things. We're really sure we can't trust brothers and sisters. We're really sure you know, we can't trust our spouses. We're, we're like so confident that we're useless in the church and we should just be a pew sitter and not come ready to serve. We're, we're, we're convinced. I can fall into this as well. But the question I keep asking myself and I ask you is, is your faith making others well? Is your faith making you well? Um, I pray that in the coming year, we grow in our faith. That we grow in our faith. That our faith will produce holy conflict. That we will fight for people's souls and fight for each other. And that our faith will be making people well. That we can tangibly say this person or I was in this space and I am no longer in this space. They are no longer in this space. They are no longer in this place. I'm going to end with this little uh, narrative. So I was struggling for a good long time with my purity. And leave it there. Purity, right? And I'm fasting. I'm praying. I'm going to conferences. I'm reading books. I'm getting, having D times with brothers. Or, I mean... If you looked at me, you would have been like, this brother's going after it. It took me like 12 years, 12 years to realize the issue wasn't the things I was doing, is that I didn't believe I could change. I didn't believe I could change. Wow. It was my faith oh, yeah. that was the issue. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And so here I am, frustrated, angry, because I'm like, I'm doing all these things. Brother so-and-so, he fasted, and he, he, he growing. Sister so-and-so, she, she going to the groups. They changing. What's going on with me? Why am I in the same place? 
And I mean, damage was done. I was asked to leave <laughs> or go for a walk, as I would like to call it. They didn't just they didn't officially disfellowship me. They was like, you need to go for a walk. I went for a walk. I was engaged. That got broken off. She nipped on me. You know what I mean? It was a mess. My life was a mess. And here I am, like, I'm doing all the right things. What's going on? What's going on? It was my faith. It was my faith. The size of our faith matters. The size of our faith matters. And so I hope that you leave here thinking about how you can grow your faith. In what areas in your life you have been faithless and let the Holy Spirit do what he do. Thank you guys.